Hello, sisters. All right. So, I think from my faces, you can assume I have lots of negative thoughts about this essay. Um, let me first list some of the things I liked about this essay. Lots of lists. I like lists. Um, she explained, like, stuff conceptually, and then she gave concrete examples of, like, um, clients. For the most part, I think, for the most part, it seemed like the vast majority of the essay came from a place of, I have a ton of experience. It just, there's so many of the essays so far, you can tell from the way the therapists talk that, like, their primary clientele is not, like, mostly lesbians. It's like they've traded a few lesbians and they've talked to other lesbian therapists and lesbian community and stuff. This essay, in particular... I was like, so this les this woman has a lot of experience specifically with treating lesbians. It seemed clear to me in her tone. The ending. Like, I get when people, I get when these women reference, like, academics who are, um, you know, like, oh, these are, like, the stages of the relationship. Or this is, like, the relationship bonding types. And they, like, list an academic who's a man. I'm like, okay, fine. It Like, here she didn't quote Freud, but she name-dropped Foucault. And I was like... But dude, why? <laughs> I mean, I guess in 1987, name dropping Foucault would be like, woo. But like, I don't know, man. Okay. I love how the title, it's like the opposite of what it is. Maple says, is she a bisexual bully? She's trying to make lesbians more... Um... More like men, yeah. Um, let me actually... Oh, I keep forgetting to do this last couple of essays. Let's check who is the author. Margaret Nichols. Is she the same freaking author as that other essay that was like all about bisexuality? Yeah. It's so interesting. The Lesbian Sexuality Issues in Developing Theory, Essay 6, which was like two weeks ago. She's the author of that. That was the first one where I went on like a big or long rant about bisexuals pretending to be lesbians and whatever. Like, at some point... No, it was horrible possible person. I mean, honestly, okay, I think this one was a pretty mixed bag. There was a lot of stuff in it that like, conceptually, I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense, right? Just like... The thing where she talks about... um, Was it... Like, a lot of the stuff, most of the stuff that she has in lists, it's, like, hard to argue with that, right? It's, like, you know, find out the history, find out what's going on with them individually. Like, this kind of stuff is hard to argue with that. But then, um, I don't know. It's just, and also the fact that in her last essay, in the last essay, I remember so clearly, because she was the first woman in the book that I'm, like, this woman is clearly a bisexual, because she literally fucking says that she's, like, attracted to men or something. Um, in the last essay, essay number six, this author is like, um, you know, some feminists criticize my perspective as being male identified. And then in this essay, in the last paragraph, she's literally like, wouldn't it be great if lesbians were more like men almost explicitly? Where is it? Let's see. Um, In some ways, lesbian sexuality needs to get more male in its orientation, with more emphasis on sex itself and perhaps less on romance. Like, I understand why that's, like, the conclusion she's drawing based on what the essay says, but why do you have to make it about, like, male sexuality? Like, basically, she's saying, like, I mean, there's, like, a lot of stuff going on in this essay, but I think one takeaway from the essay could be, um... Women have a lot of emotional attachment to sex, right? That these things are, like, enmeshed. So, if the sex is dependent on the emotional state of the relationship, obviously, this means that there's, like, high chance that the sexual dynamics in the relationship can change, right? So, she's kind of, in one aspect, she's kind of trying to say, I think... If you make your sex life less dependent on the emotional and romantic aspects of your relationship, then you will have, like, more capacity for 
more sex or better sex or something or more longer term sex or something like that and i'm like okay i understand because she explained it for like 20 pages why she's saying that but to me that just seems like really a patriarchal view of sex like i don't know i'm not like a sexologist or whatever and i actually haven't had like a ton of discussions with other women about like lesbian sex and stuff like i feel like i probably had an average amount of discussions about this but i don't know i feel like a lot of my criticisms of this essay are going to be the same as her last essay which is like she even says in earlier in the essay, she's like, it's one, th how do you diagnose what is a dysfunction, right? And she's like, we need to be very careful about how we're doing that. And if something is actually wrong, or if this is just like the way these people are or whatever. And to me, it's like, okay, so how can you have that awareness? But at the same time, make like an absolute judgment that like more sex is good sex. Like... It's so strange. It's it's one thing if lesbians come into therapy and they're like, you know, our sex life is dead. How do we fix that? It's another thing if you're like, she literally says, oh yeah, some some clients come in to therapies for like relationship issues, but actually their issue is sex. And I'm like, I'm not a therapist and I don't know who her clients are. But to me, what that what she's saying is therapists come or clients come to the office with issues about um hey Michelle. Or at least a Michelle. Clients come into the office with relationship issues. And then upon further analysis, I think they're not having enough sex. And that is, like, the problem. I don't know. I just feel like she has a lot of decent analysis. But because it's all built on, like, this, like, very male-identified perspective of things, it's very, like, I don't know, just ruins a lot of it. Um... Dragon says, every girl in university in the late 80s who wanted some sort of lesbian cred would talk about Foucault. Yeah. Um, Maple says, there was some decent stuff in there, like mentioning the oral sex phobia as a thing, but she totally ruined it with the opening statement that les with the open statement that men should lesbians should be more like men. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Puzzle person says, how many how much of a respectable profession is sexologist, really? Is there a criteria for what makes a professional a sexologist? My bias says it's mostly crap. Yeah, she doesn't call herself a sexologist. She calls herself a sex therapist. And I was actually very shocked. I mean, I don't know this like the history of sex therapy or anything like that. But quite shocked. At some point in the essay, early on, like on the third or fourth page, she basically says, like, are you someone who's thinking of doing sex therapy? Well, read the stuff by these authors and read my essay before you try it. And I'm like, again, I don't know a ton about sex therapy, but I feel like you need to do more than read a couple books to, like, not fucking damage people. <laughs> you know? I don't know. So I, yeah. I, yeah. Let's read about her history again. Like, who is this lady? Um... Margaret Nichols, PhD, clinical psychologist and sex therapist and the executive director of the Institute for Personal Growth, a private feminist psycho psychotherapy center and of Hyacinth Foundation, a cent nonprofit center for counseling, research and education. She considers herself, quote, a bisexual with gay consciousness and quote, and has a son. OK, well, there we are. Um. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, Dragon. What the fuck does sex surrogate mean? Can you define what that word means? I can't believe she practiced at, like, a f what is it here? The Institute for Personal Growth, a private feminist psychotherapy center, when she has, like, such a fucking phallocentric view of sex. It's very disturbing. Um... Okay, so I'm going to read through the live chat from the last stream because somebody brought up something that I wanted to remember and I don't remember what it is now. Okay. Um, all right. Mama, what you doing? Uh, 
Maple says, I was thinking about that essay from this book, which was saying if women only have sex once a month, it's that's not enough, end quote. Yeah, um, that's the same fucking author. So now we know. Maple said, um, if you go somewhere like our dead bedrooms, it's full of straight people saying, quote, we literally haven't had sex in years, end quote. Yeah, like... On one hand, I get why they're talking about it because, like, this is a lesbian specific book. So it's like, if they're going to talk about that issue, they're going to talk about the lesbian version of it, obviously. But on the other hand, I'm like, I'm trying to kind of think about, like, who the editors of the book are and why they put what they put in the book. And what I think is, I think there's a not a lot of reasons that will actually get a lesbian to the point where she's open to going to therapy. Especially, again, we have to consider the time period right? Like, up until the 70s, they were doing lobotomies on gay people in the US. And this is a US-based book, right? So, obviously, there was, like, a huge distrust of lesbians for therapists. So, I'm trying to think, like, what are the issues that would actually get a lesbian to see a therapist, right? And I guess this must be, like, one of the predominant issues that lesbians actually make the effort to go and see because in both this essay and the last essay about um like the actual sexual behaviors of lesbian couples it's mentioned that like most lesbians who come to therapy for sexual issues wait until it's like our sex life is so bad i'm gonna break up with you they wait till that point to see them so i guess that's why it's like a focus in the book but i agree maple it's not like a lesbian specific thing um i think the fact that it's overhyped in society so much is obviously like very patriarchal bullshit Okay. Maple, I guess maybe back in the 80s, everyone was on cocaine and fucking 900 times a day or something. <laughs> Aqua said, sex is a lot of work, especially if you don't if you don't have to do the cooking, laundry, cleaning, etc. Yeah, that's something that she mentions at the end, um, which... It was one of, the, like, the three points she mentions at the end, I think, were, like, the most sound parts of the entire essay, which is, like, I never really thought about this stuff before, right? Because um, also, I haven't been in, like, a super long relationship where the problems that she describes will eventually happen. Um, she talks about, uh, you know, if you're, like, tired and your brain is, like, in the mode of dealing with your day-to-day... This is not exactly conducive to just, like, having sex suddenly. And I think it's exactly what you're saying. It's, like, a state of mind thing. Yeah. Yeah, then she brought up the sexual surrogate thing. So, she... At the end of one section, she says... I deal almost exclusively with lesbian couples. And that... Um, if I very rarely will treat a single lesbian because it's like difficult and they don't have a sexual partner. And if I do, I never engage sexual, uh, sexual surrogates. I guess what she means is like a specific, a person specifically used to like do sex exercises from the therapy. But. Like, does that, does that imply, like, a prostitute or just, like, a friend? Or, like, what does that mean? Okay. Oh, yes. Soph said, um, she quoted, she said, virtually all lesbians have had heterosexual experience. Um, so, part of that, now that I know who the fuck the author is, I think part of that is probably that she, like, she could just considers herself, like, what is it? A bisexual with, like, a gay consciousness. I bet you she considers a lot of lesbians who are a lot of women who are bisexual to be lesbians. So that's one thing. But also there was an annotation and I want to see what the fuck that was. Like again, I'm not if you look at the average age that lesbians come out and you look at the economic situation for women in like the 70s, then it's not like shocking that a bunch of them got married and stuff, right? Actually, why am I looking through the essay? Just go to the annotations. Okay.
I think I found the reference she's using for the most lesbians have had heterosexual experience. And it's from 1977. Um, we also have to consider... I don't know. It's just like a couple different things to consider. Not only the time period, but who will take part in the study. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Maple says the fact that she calls herself bisexual and doesn't even try to claim to be quote unquote a lesbian who sometimes is attracted to men end quote makes me wonder if she's even bi or just straight just going off pattern we've seen i don't know i do think there's something i do think it's important for bisexual women to be like you know what i mostly date women or only date women or like women way more than men but i'm not going to deny that i'm a bisexual so maybe like considering she's a sex therapist maybe she's gotten to that point where she is like you know I'm like lesbian inclined but i'm not going to deny that i'm a bisexual but also maple maybe you're right i have no fucking idea um <clears throat> honestly i'm super fucking exhausted um and his essay was kind of stupid and also i realize i haven't really eaten today and it's like 2 30 okay i'm gonna quickly go through this and find the list of stuff okay So the first case study or whatever that she brings up, um, it, to me, I was like, oh, this essay is starting off on a good note, right? Because she was talking about, well, I don't know. I Honestly, it's like I've just read it. I feel like I don't have like super complex thoughts about it. Like maybe I need more time to process it. But so there's a couple and the one woman always has an orgasm or that's like the goal or whatever. And the other woman is not really doesn't really need that or want that or whatever and so this has messed up their sex life i was like okay so it is a patriarchal thing to be like without an orgasm sex hasn't happened right that's like a male perspective on sex so uh, initially i was like oh that's good right she's considering like the actual needs of the couple like not any expectations or stereotypes or whatever because it's to me in general what i've noticed from this margaret nichols is that she is like more sex is good more orgasms is good just more 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 and i'm like with women i really feel like at least with the women i've talked to about sex it's like quality over quantity so if this individual woman's sexual experiences are better when there isn't the expectation of needing an orgasm then maybe for her that they, she solved the problem the therapist has helped solve the problem right so anyway anyway initially i was like this is off to a good start because she is like not being male identified in her thinking or whatever um Abel says, I'm just paranoid about straight women claiming to be bi at this point. Yeah, what a feel, man. I mean, at least, I mean, it's worse for you because you're actually bi. Um, I think the thing that she brought up um, about how <clears throat> lesbian therapists are often role models for their patients is so interesting. Because, I mean, obviously, it makes a lot of sense, right? They're, like, professional and successful. And, I mean, I think a lot of people assume that therapists are, like, mentally well people. <laughs> so, like, well-adjusted people with, like, healthy lives or whatever. Um, and I have kind of thought about that, like in like a purely therapeutic context, when it comes to sex therapy specifically, I bet you that's like a lot stronger. Um, I just thought it was interesting. Uh, 
A wrong assumption. Tell us more, Dragon. Tell us your thoughts and feelings. Dragon says, is she Polly? I have no idea. She doesn't really talk about herself beyond like at once acknowledging that she's attracted to men. And in this essay, being like, oh no, the lesbians are being like policed because it's not politically correct to have sex fantasies about men. And I'm like, if you're having sex fantasies about men and it's not like some kind of like intrusive thought or something or like a trauma response or something, I'm like, I'm th pretty sure you're a bisexual. You know? All right. Imagine this woman as a therapist. Imagine being a bisexual and like going to her for therapy and her being like, yup, you're definitely a lesbian. Wouldn't that fuck with your head? I don't know. Let's keep going. Okay. So, okay. Good things that she brought up. I like that this, like, script analysis. Oh, no, no, no. Exactly, Dragon. I think most people assume that therapists have their shit together. But I do not think most therapists have their shit together. Because, like... Why are you so interested in this that you've made it your like profession? You're probably not not totally okay, like most people. Um, very true, Dragon. Um, yeah, Maple, I totally agree. Maple says it's therapists like her that lead to TIFF explosion. Seriously. Okay, yeah. Um, yes, Maple. The constant comparisons to gay men eats at your soul. Exactly. Fucking exactly. Like. Why is the highest, like, on a very extremely primal level, right? The lesbian comes to the lesbian sex therapist. Lesb well, this woman is clearly bisexual. And is like, you know what? I don't know if my my sex life is, like, healthy or if it's, like, fulfilling its potential or if it's not, like, satisfying to me or something, right? So what is this woman looking for? She's looking for help to become, like, connected like both psychologically and physically with like what her optimal sexuality is i cannot see how a lesbian can enter that situation with that goal in mind and be helped by being told to be more like a man and being compared to a man and having all of this like phallic phallocentric phallocratic like shit stuffed in her head i totally fucking agree So I thought this was, like, just interesting. Because, like, anecdotally, I've heard this from other, like, from talking with lesbians. But I have never. And obviously she has more experience with this than, you know, other people I've talked to. So she thinks that, like, primary anorgasmia, the complete inability to have orgasms, is pretty rare among lesbians. And it's more likely that they have secondary anorgasmia, which is, like, they can give themselves an orgasm with the other person, but, like, the other person can't give it to them. So that's interesting to me. Um... And then this, which, like, I've always thought this was, like, I've always thought this, like, I very, very strongly thought this. Like, I've talked to multiple lesbians who have um, vaginismus or dyspareunia, and she's saying it here, like, in heterosexual couples, that's, like, a big fucking deal. But in lesbian couples, you can just take penetration off the table, and then it's, like, it doesn't matter anymore. Um Fucking exactly, Maple. Maple says, how can you even begin to understand chronically understudied... The understudied... Okay. How can you even begin to understand the chronically understudied field of female sexuality if you openly... If you're openly starting with gay men as your default? Yeah. Honestly, this essay really, really makes me want to read um, Lesbian Heresy by Sheila Jeffries. Which I know she's like a poly les. But... I think that's like her fucking the whole thing of that book basically is how lesbians have started like idolizing 
like gay male culture or gay men or gay men's sexuality and they have like internalized that and taken it on as their own culture and how it's like perverted um lesbians minds and our behavior and our culture and stuff um I really, really want to read it eventually, and I'll probably read it on this channel just because I feel like it's so fucking relevant to everything. Everything. Um, yeah, exactly, Dragon. Dragon says we need to stop comparing our sex lives to men. We are different. We cannot... Can we not be happy with that difference? Yes! That's what I mean. When she's... When she's comparing, like... Um, yeah I don't know honestly my my biggest issue with this essay is that the conclusion of this essay is the same as the conclusion of her other essay in the book which makes me kind of be like why didn't you write one super long essay instead of two different essays with the same fucking point like if I had to read your bullshit at least I should have only had to read it once okay One moment, please. So this is from a French website, but the book is in English. So, um, I mean, obviously, or maybe not obviously, if you have money, please support SpinFX Press because they are like the radical feminist press, like publisher. Um, but also, like, if not having the money to buy it is going to stop you from reading it, just you know, reading it's more important. <laughs> like, pirate it and read it. Okay. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up, I think, pretty quickly. I'm feeling very tired and hungry and annoyed with this fucking author, to be totally honest with you. All right. Kaz says, maybe this is the no true Scotsman of me. Oh, maybe this is no true Scotsman of me. But... I feel like an actual lesbian wouldn't be comparing themselves to men all the time. I know she's likely bi, but I feel like she calls herself lesbian. No, she literally is a bisexual. It says in her like blurb in the back of the book, it says that she's a bisexual who has like a gay consciousness or whatever. Um, yeah. I think if a lesbian came to the therapist... And was like constantly comparing herself to gay men. The therapist should be like. Why is your sense of sexuality so separated from yourself? Why are you importing your sense of sexuality? Or your sexual expectations? Or your sexual scripts? Or whatever. Why are you importing that? If you're importing it, it must not be like an authentic thing from the self. Right? Like. Dragon says, I want to know who the dirty scoundrel was who changed the goal from liberation to equality. Why would I want to lower myself to be equal? Yeah. Like, she literally, on like the third page of the essay, 
She literally says, do we assume that low levels of sexual contact are abnormal? She's being like, we need to question our assumptions about sexuality. And then she like literally ends the fucking essay by being like, not enough sex is a bad thing. Like, if she were, if she kept bringing it back to the point of like, because these women came into the therapy office because not if they're having sex, that's not enough for them. I would be like, okay. But she doesn't keep bringing it back to that point. She keeps generalizing that all lesbians all have this problem. And to me, that's like fucking offensive. And like, not even like offensive, just like, misguided like what the fuck are you talking about it's like why i don't know i don't, I don't know it's just all very strange okay okay let's read one of the lists are you reading are you ready okay when confronted with low sexual frequency in lesbian couples i generally attempt differential diagnosis with regard to the following possible diagnoses one Sexual inhibition problems in one member of the partnership, including history of assault or incest. Two, extraordinarily high sexual desire on the part of one partner. Three, relationship problems surfacing via the sexual relationship. Four, sexual script problems, for example, the case presented earlier. Five, sexual frequency problems that are the secondary result of another sexual problem, such as an oral sex phobia. Or six, sexual frequency problems as a result of simple boredom and the need for... Sexual enhancement in a long-term relationship. Okay, that was a stupid list to read. There's not much I have to say about that. Um, sex therapists are unlikely to encounter couples in which both partners are avarice or both agree to exclude cunnilingus from their sexual repertoire. I found that a bit interesting. I mean, I don't know a lot about this topic, but she brought that up several times. And at first, I mean... <laughs> It's also kind of stupid. She's pretty vague in what she says. Like, I get that she's trying to, like... I mean, no, I don't get it. Because later on in the essay, she she gets, like, quite explicit. Um, yeah, at some point in the essay, she's, like, quoting someone. And she's like, why don't you go down on me or something? And so that's, like, a specific thing, right? At this point in the essay, with this, like, phobia of conolingus or, like, like, this oral sex phobia or whatever. I'm like, who? On whose part? Who has the phobia? And what does that, like, actually mean? Like, what does it actually mean? It's very vague to me. Because I wasn't sure if she meant, like, women are scared of doing it or women are scared of receiving it. And I was like, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's the thing, too. Like, Puzzle Person says, is it really so bad that I don't like that feeling of a mouse mouth on that area? Exactly. Like, if you don't like it, you don't like it. Um... I don't know. I don't know. Like, to me, it's like if one partner really wants to do that to the other partner and the other partner doesn't want it. That, to me, is like you're incompatible, maybe. Like, sexually incompatible. You know? Like, to me, again, it's like less is more because comfort is what leads to good sex, right? Like, for women. Comfort and safety is what leads to good sex, so less is more. So, if... If your partner isn't into a specific act, I don't see how, like, desensitizing them and getting them to do that for you is going to lead to, like, a long-term, more fulfilling sexual relationship, right? I don't fucking get it at all. Um, like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm not where, like, involved enough in these kind of conversations, but, and I don't know a lot about, like, sex therapy generally, but to me, I feel like she should have had at least one sentence somewhere that was like, you know, if someone comes into the therapy office and they're like, I want to do this sex thing with my partner, but I'm not comfortable with it, can you help me? I feel like she should have had one sentence being like you need to address why do they want to do that do they want to do that because they want to give their partner what they want regardless of like how it affects them or because like it's something that they genuinely like want to do but they're just like they need to become okay with doing that do you know what I, like like the motivation at no point like 
it's again it's very vague like in postmodern like the motivation is like oh like to keep the relationship I just I don't know I I feel like there should have been some kind of discussion of like why are they coming in for therapy and like because the entire essay operates on the assumption 100% that if someone is not into something um it's better if they are okay with that or like it would be optimal if they could be, get into that or whatever and i'm like but why i don't think that's that to me is very like i don't like that that's very strange like i don't know like i've talked to women who used to be stoned and then weren't anymore and for a lot of them it was like an emotional psychological thing like she kind of brings it up actually um that if you have like sexual trauma from when you were a child obviously or if you have um if you had like a lot of coming out issues right like you had a lot of like internalized homophobia that this can affect your like sexual self-perception but she doesn't even fucking go into detail about that like the women i knew who used to be stoned and then stopped being stoned it like they had like some kind of like come to jesus moment about like accepting their lesbianism or whatever and then they were like okay with it or they had like a partner who like they like really could let their guard down with like nobody else and then they became something like that right i feel like like i don't know i just i don't like her whole attitude on the whole thing okay dragon says thanks for creating this great space not been feeling good about the crap going on in other spaces my inner kid has been spazzing out so it's nice to come here oh well i'm glad you're here dragon um yeah, it's nice to have you here. Um, Yeah, I agree, Maple. Okay. Puzzle person says, I wonder how much of a problem it really is. If my tastes do originate partially in trauma... Does that mean they need to change when I'm fine with them or they hurt and they hurt no one? Yeah, exactly. It's like, to me, it's like a lot of ethical questions about the assumptions made in this essay or like the, yeah. Um, the next essay, I'm kind of conflicted about it. Um, it's the first essay that I kind of partially read beforehand because it's about incest. Um Yeah, I, it kind of addresses that. I didn't get to the end of the essay, but I'm very nervous to do that essay. I actually thought about skipping it or doing it in a different format or something, but I think I should just do it like usual. And if I think it's like really upsetting or it's horrible or something, I can take it down. Um Yeah, dragon, exactly. She's like, some women don't like receiving it. Some women love giving it. So it would be a mismatch. Yeah, it's like a compatibility thing. Um, yeah. Okay. Ugh. And like, at some point in the essay, I'm kind of going in order, but kind of not. At some point in the essay... Well, yeah, I mean, it's really annoying to me how she brings up, like, the lesbian feminist perspective on sex and, like, all of this. Like, the lesbians are so like, political about, like, what's politically correct about sex. But then they don't... This maple, this to me is, like, an issue to talk about. What maple is saying here, she says, no judgment on women who don't like receiving oral, especially if you only enjoy receiving pleasure in other ways. Yeah, okay, so, like, to me it's not... Um, 
if there was going to be a discussion about like what are like the stereotypes or expectations of lesbian sex it would be like oh you know is like a really big emphasis on like oral among lesbians but like maybe some women don't like that so like that's okay like it's especially if she's so obsessed with gay men like the inverse i mean i've taken part or seen this discussion so many times like back when i used to think i was a gay guy lol but like so many gay dudes online will have discussions of like you know anal is like the epitome of gay sex but actually i fucking hate it i don't want to do either part of it and how it's like it's such a stereotype for them that it's like kind of a big deal when you don't want to do that right so same i would say like if she's so fucking obsessed with gay men why didn't it occur to her to like bring this up in this because she fucking talks about it a lot. Why didn't she bring up that aspect of it? It's very, like, very strange to me. Oh, hey, Rachel. You missed, like, two hours of talking about sex. <laughs> fossil person says well that would be actually relevant you see we can't do that you're right that's totally my bad i shouldn't have assumed that she could like think for herself or actually center lesbians rachel it's by the same fucking author who wrote that that bisexual essay oh yeah okay so one of the things she brings up in the essay is that like the sexual script thing which i think is like an interesting concept and like how you have like the things that you like to do and that you guys do together and it becomes kind of like a routine or that, like, in your mind, this is, like, these are the steps of sex, or whatever. And how, like, that can be part of the problem, and you need to, like, change that up. And I'm like, okay, makes sense, right? And then she's like, you know how you can change that up? Have hookups. Get into BDSM. <laughs> I was like, dude, why? Dude, why? Like, you can definitely, like, spice up sex with, like, other stuff that's not BDSM. Or hooking up with strangers. <laughs> like... It's so stupid. Yeah, exactly. If Rachel's like, for fuck's sake. Exactly. Also, when she brought up a cucumber, I was like, aren't you like a sex therapist? Aren't you supposed to tell people don't don't put anything into your body that doesn't have a flared base? Like, is this new information? Don't put anything into your body that doesn't have a flared base. Why are you bringing up recommending using cucumbers in bed? Whatever. Okay. I feel like this conversation has like lowered the... <laughs> the like the level of the chat okay let's keep going <laughs> okay okay um okay assessment of sex problems so after her whole disclaimer of like we can't make it patriarchal assumptions um she also has to bring up fluids oh my god dragon you came after she talks about gay men having sex she talks about like scat and what's the word for it whatever with p and i'm like She's like, yeah, these are like normal, like aphrodisiacs for gay men or something. And then she's like, and it's so offensive that they call them paraphilias. And I'm like, why are you telling this to lesbians? Do lesbians need to know about this? Is this, I'm so sorry, Rachel. I'm like, why do lesbians need to know about this? What does this have to do with anything? And then, yeah, when she's like, exactly like Reagan's saying, like when she brings up like spicing up your sex life, she's like, you could try like stuff with pee. And I'm like, but why? Why? <laughs> Yeah. It's, yeah. Like, I feel like she's definitely a bad sex therapist if that's, like, that seems to me, like, so, like, outside the relationship that it's, like, you're not actually addressing any of the problems. <laughs> exactly, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, spice up your sex life by telling your partner you care about them. Rachel, I don't know about that. It seems like you really like are paying attention to women's needs and desires and that kind of shit. Obviously, you're not thinking enough about men when you come to this kind of conclusion, Rachel. <laughs> Maple, like at the exact same fucking time, Maple said useless advice for women. Exactly. Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> okay, she talks about the assessment, right? So let's go to another list. A great love list. Let's go through the list. One, these are the things that she, when, like, when she first gets the clients, she tries to go through these things. Um, and she says she tries to get them all in the first session. She doesn't want to, like, let time pass. One, what is the problem in exact terms? Not, we don't have sex very often, but 
we only have sex once a month and I would like it to be twice a week. Not our sex life isn't as exciting as I would like it to be, but I would like her to go down on me and she won't. So, specificity. Okay, good. How can you argue with that? Two. What is the history of this problem? When did it start and what are the circumstances? Um, has it been chronic, periodic, or acute? Most critically, is this a problem either woman has experienced before, either alone or with other partners? Again, I not much to object about that. What other attempts have the couple made to solve this problem? How did they work? This tells me what interventions to avoid, as well as giving me some idea of what behavior has maintained the problem because attempts to solve a problem often turn out to be turn out to worsen the situation. This one I found really like actually insightful. Makes a lot of sense, right? Because it's like if you tried to change it in XYZ ways, but like B never got changed, then you can be like, oh, B is the problem, right? Um and also that it worsens that. I don't really I wish she would have gone into more detail about what how is does she how has she observed that? <clears throat> Four. Along the same lines, what are the individual's own assessments of the problem? <clears throat> Often couples have a very good idea of how problems started, what caused them. They know how they got into this mess, into the mess they are in. They just don't know how to get out. Even if I think the assessment is out of line, this question at least gives me information about the belief systems I need to cope with in divesting, in devising my strategies. If a client feels her problems are the result of early childhood conflicts and I privately disagree, I know I have to frame my intervention in terms of solving childhood conflicts in order to make it acceptable to the client. This is like, I don't know, just seems to be like good therapy, right? To like consider the client's mentality while you're doing shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maples like spice things up by taking a bath together or like doing it on the living room floor talking more during sex trying new positions not god damn not goddamn piss please yeah <laughs> um rachel says too many women compare women loving women's sex to sex with men just because men need to torture their bodies to achieve boring orgasms doesn't mean women have any similarity. Exactly! Like, keep in mind, in the last essay by this author, she literally compared a study of, like, arousal between females and males, when female and male arousal is, like, not comparable by any metric. You can't even measure it the same. So, like, like, this author is not, is not good. Um, okay i'm gonna stop reading these out like entirely because they're kind of long now this the fifth point is basically about like when like why did they come to therapy now and not last week or last year um this is where she brings up for in when one of many instances where she brings up that a lot of the times they come because like they're basically at the point of breaking up because their sex life is, like, dead. Um, and that this should be taken into consideration with treatment and assessment, obviously. Okay. The sixth point. Oh. This I found interesting. I mean, obviously, I don't know much about sex therapy. But I found this interesting. To be, like... She wants to get a really detailed description of the last time they made love. So, like... Who did what? Who approached who? How did they feel about it? What were, like, the acts that were performed, this kind of stuff. On it's I don't know. On some degree, I feel like it's intrusive. But I guess any sex therapy must be intrusive. So, But I just thought that was interesting. Um, <laughs> I 
Ali says, I learned that male slash female mental stimulation and orgasms are completely different. It was quite fascinating. Explained why so much. Why men are so douchey and why women are so phenomenal. Ali, you're in medical school, right? Or am I wrong? Um, my God. Rachel says, men have literally told me I was denying their humanity by not wanting to always have sex. Jesus fucking Christ, see the the person, not the potential for orgasms. This is why women are different. Yeah. I feel like people probably used to have more sex than they do now. Because, like, 300 years ago, Dragon. Because what else was there to do? They didn't have the internet. Most of them couldn't read. Like... <laughs> Oh, that's so interesting, Ali. Um, at one point, possible person, at one point she does bring up that like a lot of the time um, <clears throat> it is like a relationship issue that's just being like shown through like the issue with sex, right? And um, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think a tolerance break is a good idea. Yeah, and she never brings that up. So, puzzle person, I'm going to play devil's advocate and defend the author by something you just said. So, puzzle person said, or you could even hear me out, except that you don't need to fuck like rabbits to be satisfied. Yes. Oh, no, wait, that's not the thing I was wanting to reply to. Also, oh, like, take a break, and if it doesn't return, then the relationship needs work, end of. So, she brings up at some point in the essay that a lot of lesbians, their mentality towards sex seems to be, if I'm in love with this person, and we're, like, on the same page, sex should just happen, like, spontaneously all the time. Like, not not all the time, but when sex happens, it should be spontaneous. Um, and that she's kind of, like, this is a naive view of sexuality, because after the limerence, like, the honeymoon phase of the relationship, um... This usually is not how sex works. Which, honestly, I don't have, like, personal knowledge of whether this is or isn't true. But I do think, like, she's just kind of talking about, like, adults having sex. And I mean adults in terms of, like, you have, like, responsibilities and, like, stresses in your life and shit like that. So, you know, you're not always in the headspace for sex. I don't think that's proof that, like... I don't know. I just... Basically, the fact that you said that made me think of this part of her essay. I don't know. It's so strange, though. Because at no point in the essay does she bring up, like, romance or, like, intimate emotional connection or anything. Like, to me, that would be, like, one of the number one things I would look at, like, with lesbians specifically, if they're having, like, a sexual issue. Because as we know, as she points out, she's obviously aware of it, as she points out, like, lesbian sex is very, very tied to, like, emotions. So, like, she does mention a couple times it could be, like, a symptom of, like, a bigger issue in the relationship. But I'm, like, instead of being, like, let's go to an S&M club, maybe you could be, like, let's have some, like, intentionally physical intimacy without any sex involved. Or, like, intentional emotional intimacy without any sex involved or something, right? Because, like, that's how fucking women work. Um... Yeah, everybody's like, porn has fucked shit up. I totally agree, obviously. Kaz says it doesn't help that men demanding sex so often fucks with your libido and how you view sex as is. And how you view sex. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but still, yeah. My god, Kaz, don't fucking reply while you're driving. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. <laughs> 
Don't be that person who texts while you drive. Okay. Okay, we're close to the end. <laughs> okay, I'm very glad, Kaz. Please, in the future, also do that. <laughs> um, Maple says, did she even mention lesbian massage once? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my god, yes. Dragon says she likes the fast forward button because there's so much sex in TV shows now. Yeah. I use the like skip 10 seconds. Like I mostly watch stuff. But whatever, you know, it's like the skip 10 second button. I use it like a lot. And I also just watch everything fast. <clears throat> yeah. Like, oh my god, I remember I watched because you know I used to think I was a gay man. Um, I watched Queer as Folk, like not the I did watch the British one at least twice, but I, I don't really remember that. I didn't really have like fond memories of the British one, the American one, which technically is actually in film in Toronto. Um, which dragon with a leather man on? Uh, I watched that like at least three times in its entirety, and I I just wanted to see them like falling in love and crap. So I skipped like all of the sex scenes, and because I skipped all the sex scenes, I remember being like, wow. Like, one-third of the runtime of this show is just sex. Like, isn't that crazy? Um, Rachel says, watching actors make out grosses me out. Yeah. Like, when I was a kid, it grossed me out because I was just like, ew, kissing. But now, it grosses me out because it's like, these people want to be touching each other in that way. Like, they're just doing it for money. Like, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Another list. Therapeutic tools. I think this is where we're all going to get a little bit angry. They're also usually bad at it. You mean the sex that you see in TV is bad sex? Yeah. Okay, let's do a poll because I have that ability and it's like it's very intimate. It's always like the same handful of women. Okay. I wonder how many lesbians are here. Let's do it first just for the lesbians. No, we're all women. Let's do it like this. Okay. Not sure how to phrase this or pose the question. I want to ask, when you feel sexual attraction to another woman, does it come usually before or after an emotional connection? Okay. And I'm fucking with your Miss Aprini or whatever, and I give me a sec. <laughs>
Okay, so obviously I wish I could have given you more options, but I was just doing it on the fly. So that's the options you have. Okay. No, this is not just for lesbians. This is for anyone. Well, if you're a female, it's for the females who are attracted to females, I guess. If you're straight, I, this is not the for question for you. Okay. Corner says both, but the emotional connection takes it to a completely different level. Mm-hmm. Mabel says, I feel like when I was younger, it was fully about emotional connection first, but I kind of trained myself to be more visual because it was more male and therefore better. Yeah. I, most of you have said most of the time. For me, it's like, a hundred percent of the time, I've only ever been attracted to a handful of women in my entire life. Okay, I, I will, Kaz, I will change your vote psychologically in my mind. It's okay, don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, like, to me, it's like, it's necessary. Like, I'm a demisexual. <laughs> AKA a fucking woman most of the time, honestly. Um, yeah, so given this, the author's conclusion of, like, if... Okay, I mean, I should have given, like, I wish I could have given, like, seven options. But, like, whatever. If it's, like, most of the time. Uh, oh, you're also changing it to 100%. Okay, so two of you have changed it from most of the time to 100%. So the percentage has gone, it's 12 votes. The percentage has gone up about 10%, I think. Yeah. Um, That's very interesting. Marian says she started with emotional, then in the middle, in her middle ages, it was like half and half, and now she needs emotional again. That's very interesting. It's like a cycle. Fossil version is most of the time for me, but for me, if it's the horny time of my cycle, <laughs> uh, I would never act on it without genuine emotional attraction, though. Yeah, that too. That too, like, even the concept of, like, as she calls it, tricking. Like, hookups. So, she literally fucking says multiple times. It just makes no... F there's no continuity in her in her position. She says multiple times. Lesbians, when they have sex, it's an affair. It's emotional. It's not just sex. Then she's like, you want to fix a relationship? Go have an affair. Like, both in that essay, and it's like, this essay she doesn't say it explicitly, but it's implied heavily, I think. Um, false person says, honestly, being on T changed my sexuality, and I'm still capable of some visual attraction, which I wasn't able to before. Um, Rachel says, since T transitioning, because she was also on T, and reconnecting with womanhood in my body, it's more emotional-based. Yeah. So, like, this is obviously not, like, a scientific study or anything. But to me, it indicates that, like, this is how women fucking are. So if you operate from the assumption that it would be women, it would be better if women were not the way they are. It's like, then every single woman who comes into your office, you can diagnose with a dysfunction because she's not a fucking man. Um... Marion says, I also noticed looking back that some of the best relationship relationships wasn't the ones where I was super attracted. It's the ones where we were doing cool stuff together. Yeah. Like, I think the emotional leads the sexual, not the sexual leads the emotional, at least for women most of the time. I'm pretty sure. Jade says, when I was 14, I started conditioning myself to behave more boy-like. But I've really not been attracted to women for their bodies recently, only with emotional connections, I guess. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's the thing, too, is, like, it's hard to know what do you actually feel or what is, like, noise, you know, from the outside. It's so hard. 
are we all homoromantic gray sexuals? Obviously, possible person. Obviously, all lesbians are homoromantic gray sexuals, and we're just in denial of our homoromantic gray sexualness. <laughs> Wait, was it difference between gray and demi? I can't remember. I think it's a good thing I can't remember. There's not much things that I can't remember about queer crap. <laughs> all right. So we're on the last list. Or actually, it can be the second last list. Whatever. Okay. Therapeutic tools. So she's just like, these are some of the things I found that are helpful. So like, these are things to consider. When possible, I go from simple to complex rather than the other way around. Okay. That's the... Okay. Thank you, possible person. Okay, there's not much to say about that. Two. Along the same lines, I frequently use sensate focus as a partly diagnostic, partly therapeutic technique. I employ the Masters and Johnson technique that use a series of gradually more sexual pleasuring exercises. I will frame the sensate focus homework in a win-win way. Either you will find a positive experience or and that will be helpful or or else you will feel you will experience negative thoughts and attitudes and that will help us pinpoint your problem i thought that was pretty interesting and also like i mean yes embrace the vagueness because rachel literally she mentions this on like the second page that she likes this like sensate focus thing and i was like oh that's like what is that that's so interesting because to me that was more like 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 physical intimacy that's not necessarily sexual like the the spectrum between like that physical intimacy that's not necessarily sexual and like physical intimacy that is sexual i was like oh is that what she's gonna be talking about um and then she literally is like i'll explain it later guys and then this is i think the explanation which is very broad um i mean i guess if you're a therapist you're just supposed to like look up the masters and johnson stuff but like this is obviously not like a how to or anything but it was um anyway the thing that i liked about the way at least the way she presents it, i'm not sure the way she practices it um with the sensate stuff um is um thanks dragon that it's definitely it's like literally only about what you're feeling with each other right it's not about, like, does the therapist think, like, this is good or bad? Or, like, do you have, like, all kinds of weird ideas about shit? I don't know. <laughs> you can't use mere words to explain the mastery of my humanity. Because <laughs> you know what humanity is. It's having a bunch of labels. That's what humanity is. Okay. Uh, three. Oh, yo, you guys mentioned this and she mentioned it. I forgot. I try to encourage a ban on sex within the relationship for the duration of therapy and especially a ban on outside affairs for the time of therapy. But as discussed earlier, I do not do this in, a, in an, authoritari an authoritarian way. I often say something like, of course, I can't tell you what to do, but... And then elaborate in a straightforward manner all the reasons why the bans would be productive and advisable. Wow, possible person, you're the reason that my video only has nine likes because you unliked it. <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I don't have much to say about that. It seems good. Many of my techniques are behavioral and include systematic desensitization procedures. For example, I find in vivo desensitization to be the therapy of choice for lesbians with oral sex phobias, sensate focus, guided imagery, and fantasy. At times, I also use hypnosis for its vague, its value with imagery, fantasy, and visualization, rather than for purposes of direct suggestion. Okay, I know what in vivo means in a medical sense, but I don't fucking understand what it means here in the therapeutic sense. She just means like... <laughs> Yeah, where's where's Toss Stones with her lesbian albatrosses? Um, 
For example, I find in vivo desensitization to be the therapy of choice for lesbians with oral sex phobias. I don't know, bro. That just rubbed me the wrong way. Like, when I read that, if I'm interpreting it the way that it's meant that she means it, what she's saying is, like, if a woman is uncomfortable with something, make her, like, overlook that boundary or, like, unaware of that boundary. And then it'll be better. Like... I don't know, just, like, from the stone, the previously stone butch women I've talked to, who later were okay with that, it's, like, the fact that they had, like, an emotional reason to, like, do it made it, like, a positive thing. Like, the way she's describing it is, like, instead of making it a negative thing, make it, like, a neutral thing. And I'm, like, why make it a negative or a neutral thing? Let it be how it is. And if it becomes a positive thing, that's okay. Or fucking exactly, dragon. Exactly. Is, is she talking about giving or receiving? I don't know. I don't know. Rachel says, but like sometimes people just don't work together sexually. Yeah. Yeah. It's very weird. Okay. I should just, instead of saying IRL or like in real life or in person, I should just start saying in vivo all the time now to sound more pretentious. <laughs> okay. Okay. Couples counseling is a useful way to approach sex therapy because first, many sexual problems really are or have become a couple problem rather than individual problem. And she's like, I also need to find out if this, like, is this is a sexual problem like within the couple or like with one of the members of the couple? This is repetitive. She's mentioned this before. Um, She does bring up in this here, in this point number five, that she has found group settings for lesbians to talk about sexual problems really good. And honestly, I wonder what that looks like. I think it might be really good. Um, But she says they're very hard to put together. And, you know, in these days, like, unless it's virtual, it's like literally a thousand percent impossible to put it together. But I think that's just really interesting. Um, I never really thought about that. Ali, that sucks, man. Um, Rachel, it's also a really good point. Rachel says, yeah, and can't it be contextual? Like, I don't like it with... I don't like this with others, but I like it with this woman. Yeah, very, very true. Um, That's kind of what I was talking about. And I was talking about these women I know who used to be stoned and are not stoned. Like a lot of them, it was like a specific girlfriend who they had like a specific dynamic with. Who they like tried it for the first time and it was like a non-scary, non-threatening thing or whatever. Like whatever, right? Being touched by another woman. So I'm like... I don't think staying with the same woman and trying to, like, desensitize yourself to something that makes you, like, uncomfortable is, like, the solution. CM says, is this for women who really want to overcome feeling uncomfortable about it? Because it's okay to just not like something. There are other things you can do. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah, that's, again, when I... Wow, it's been an hour. I think about an hour ago, maybe 45 minutes ago, I was like, why doesn't she talk about the motivations? Why? Why is woman in therapy? Why is this woman coming to you for this issue? Is it because all her life she's wanted to do this thing and she has like, you know, baggage that's preventing her from doing it? Or 
Is it because her current girlfriend is like, if you don't let me do this to you, I'm going to leave you? And depending on what the answer to that kind of question is, should, you know, lead what's going on in the therapy. And she never mentions, like, any kind of ethical um, questions like that. Oh, there's 14 of you here. So now I'm going to... Um, Oh, fuck, I can't remember the right word for that. Rachel and I are doing a sister space on Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, noon Eastern time, 5 p.m. GMT. So if you would like to come, please come and set an alarm on your phone or go to my YouTube channel and set reminder and you will get a notification probably. <laughs> Rachel says I prefer to eat vegan and that is not what I read it <laughs> um, ugh, I love angel hair it's amazing okay this last one <laughs> I used to have a um I used to have two different button shops on Etsy where I sold pinback buttons. And in my like rad fem one, I had a whole section for like eco-feminists and vegans. And one of the buttons said, um, eat pussy, not meat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, okay, the last one. I found it kind of interesting, but I am like, I think it needs to be done very specifically for it to be, like, effective or useful or healthy and not, like, a huge par harmful thing. Okay. Bibliotherapy is an invaluable tool, particularly when dealing with sexual problems. I'm pretty sure when I read this, I said bibliography, which is... You know, embarrassing. Okay. Sexual problems that are rooted in homophobia. I agree with that. I think if you have internalized a lot of hetero normative homophobic narratives and archetypes and values and paradigms to do with sex and romance, right? That reading good romance that is not like with really really toxic unhealthy shit all over it because most romance is like has toxic unhealthy shit in it could help you internalize a positive archetype narrative whatever of homosexuality right because like you know the way i keep i keep mentioning this all the time it's like when you're in society it's like you're a computer and all the data that's being put into you is like um misogynistic and homophobic right so to me like from that basis it makes sense like input some positive stuff instead of negative stuff and see what happens um in a sense bibliotherapy is an alternative to a group and provides much the same thing not simply information but validation from other women in addition erotic books can be useful in therapy as methods of helping women become more sexual and do discovery and to discover previously unknown aspects of their sexuality. Okay, that I don't agree with. Because I'm pretty damn sure that it's like, read this like kinky, porny book. And then like, try all the kinky, porny shit. And I don't know. Like, I mean, it's one thing if you like, read an erotica or like a romance novel with a sex scene in it. And you're like, oh, they did this thing that I've never heard of before. And it sounds cool. Let's try that. It's another thing to be like... Oh, I've read Fifty Shades of Grey. Let's, like, can you tie me up and whip me now? Right? Um, exactly. Rachel says, women loving women, relationships written by women for women. Yeah. Which doesn't even really exist. Like, it does. But it's, like, Fifty Shades of Ugh. <laughs> okay. All right. So, the stuff I found 
most um where is that here it's 50 shades of please stop 50 shades of my safe word <laughs> okay okay um where's the thing here okay so she talks about enhancing sexuality which i um <clears throat> again i just like question what the fuck does she mean by that Gilbert Gottfried, but why? <laughs> That's not a Oh, wasn't that on um um oh what's his name? Something Oliver. John Oliver. John Oliver had Gilbert Gottfried read like one page of Fifty Shades on his show. Marion. What an ism Marion says, I totally feel this. To me, sex is like sugar. I love it, but not straight from the bag with a spoon. Yeah. So, the sexual enhancement thing, I'm like, okay, cool. So, it's like you're having sex and there isn't any problems, but you want to have, like, better sex. Okay. That's kind of hard to argue with that. Like, if you, you want to do better, then you can try better, okay? The... <clears throat> so, he brings up three things that are like aspects and I don't even think this is necessarily um, an aspect of like how to make sex better but like just things to consider in your sex life to like assess the state of your sex life right um, time build up and variety so in time she discussed like the time of day like the time like do you have energy what's your state of mind like the the actual time that you're timing to have the sex right then she talks about build up um So here she talks about two things. She talks about one, like, simmering, which is basically, like, psyching yourself up for sex all day so that when it actually happens, you're like, oh, I'm excited to do it now. That you're, like, psychologically into it, right? The other thing she brings up is, um... Oh, yeah. That you need to be in the right state of mind, specifically. So you need to, like, decompress from your day-to-day -day stuff to, like, get into the state of mind to, like, build the sexual thing. So she even mentions, like, maybe you each need to take some time alone before you have sex. To, like, build anticipation or whatever. Which is, like, interesting. Um, and then the last thing... Uh, oh, variety. Which is where she brings... Okay, let's let's list the... Act, let's see the actual list so we can laugh about her ridiculous crap. Okay. So she quotes Foucault. Thank God. Because, you know, what would women do without Foucault to tell us how to be sexual? Here's the quote. For centuries, people have always spoken about desire and never about pleasure. We have to liberate our desire, they say. No, we have to create new pleasure, and then maybe desire will follow. Why? This is just like some male ego trip bullshit. This is stupid. I don't agree with that. Stupid. Okay, so. Then, immediately after. It will be helpful to many lesbian couples to spend more energy introducing new pleasure, variety, and innovation in a playful way into their sex lives. Okay, like, on its face. You know, variety is good. But we know what she means when she says that. And it's not good. So. This can include the use of toys or props. Everything from dildos and vibrators, lotions and ice cubes, cucumbers and feathers and silk scarves, to wrist and ankle cuffs and paddles. That list is actually pretty tame. I don't know if, like, because most of those things are sensory. And then the, like, the last, like, wrist cuffs, that's bondage. And the last one is, like, pain. Well, I guess you could argue it's still, like, but there's a line between, like, sensory and pain. To me, it's very, like, propagandist to throw all that shit in one list. 
to be like, yep, like a feather or an ice cube. Like we talked about this in her last essay where she's like, yeah, introducing an ice cube in bed is the same as whipping each other. I'm like, that's not the same thing. Um, Mood enhancers. This one, it feels like she actually fucking knows what a woman is or what a woman wants sexually. Um, uh, music, candles, lighting, romantic dinners, and settings can include dress up, new places, or atmospheres. Like, that's kind of what Maple was saying before. Yes. I've never tried the ice cube and feather stuff, and I do not want to. I'm very ticklish. Like, this is not going to be a good thing. <laughs> this is going to, like, stop everything. Um, Okay. Uh, also, just like in the last essay, she literally was like, I had one client who became so obsessed with BDSM that she became like very like fucked in the head and committed suicide. So in that essay, she was being like, you should explore BDSM, but being like, look, there it can be bad. So be careful. I still didn't agree with it, but I was like, at least she's, you know, in this essay, she's like, you should explore BDSM. There is not a single fucking sentence in the essay that is like, explore BDSM, but make sure you're not like being unhealthy about it. Um, so in some ways, what I'm saying about sexual enhancement all amounts to the same thing. Making sex more rewarding for ongoing couples means making sex more of a priority. And making sex more of a priority means thinking about it more. Thinking about it more and setting aside more sensual physical time together. Yeah, that to me is like the most unobjectable part of the entire essay. Uh, and then the last paragraph. Let me just read the last paragraph. It seems to be my thing now. You're starting a sex drop, Rachel. <laughs> Honestly, when I imagine feathers in bed, I imagine, like, the synthetic plastic ones from the dollar store. Because, like, where would where do you even get real feathers? Would you want to, like, get them, you know, dirty with stuff? Like, I don't know. I never really thought about it. Okay. In some ways... Wait... No, never mind, that's a stupid thing to say. Okay, this is the last paragraph. In some ways, lesbian sexuality needs to get more male in its orientation, with more emphasis on sex itself and perhaps less on romance. How about you integrate the two, fucking idiot? Trends in the lesbian community suggest that this is happening, and I see these trends as, on the whole, extremely healthy. I mean, look where we are today, lady. We have women offering to be sugar mamas on lesbian dating apps, and the lesbian dating apps are full of men with their dicks. So obviously it hasn't turned out very well, has it? The therapist working with lesbians on their sexuality, whether to help solve sexual problems or to enhance a stagnant sexual relationship, plays a role not only with her or his clients, but also within the community at large. If our attitudes are sex positive, sex expanding, and playful, we model for the community, a vision toward which we can strive. I don't know. Mabel, don't say these things. <laughs> I don't know, man. This essay sucked. Okay. So the next essay. Um, like I said. Is about incest. Specifically, it's about father-daughter incest. Um, it meant it does talk about like the Oedipal complex. That's what, yeah. It it does talk about how it affects the relationship with the mother, but it doesn't. As far as I've seen, I haven't read the essay entirely, but I've skimmed through a bunch of it. It does reference this whole like. Freudian connection to the mother thing, but not in like the exact way. Um, yeah. Oh, bye, Rachel. So I don't know. I'm going to read it. 
Um, also, it keeps it frames like lesbianism explicitly entirely as a preference. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to be very offended by it. Um, but I think it's trying to get at, uh, you know, the high rates of like rape by fathers towards girls who grew up to become lesbians. And whether I completely disagree or completely agree with her conclusions, or actually I think there's three authors, or is there one author? No, there's just one author. Whether I disagree or agree with her conclusions, um, I think she's trying to get at, like, what is the effect of that on, like, your self-perception of your sexuality and, like, what you're comfortable with sexually and stuff. Which I think is, like, you know, a good conversation to have for lesbians, but I think it needs to be done very carefully. I'm not sure if I'm able to do that. Like, we're going to try, and if I think it's not good, I'll take it down. We'll see. So that should be tomorrow afternoon. Or it's going to be tomorrow, 9 a.m. Pacific time, noon Eastern time, um, 5 p.m. GMT. Oh. Yeah, her theories are based on Freud, Chodoro, Slip, and Kohut. I know who Freud and Chodoro are. I don't know who Slip and Kohut are. Kohut. I'm not sure how you say it. Also, just the way that she's using, like, narratives and archetypes, like the Persephone complex, um, generally. And there's it also starts with a poem by the author. It seems to me kind of, like, Jungian. And generally, I like that more than Freudian stuff. So, I mean, we'll see. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Ali's going, all right. Okay, so, yes, uh, as always. Oh, yo, I keep meaning to tell you guys, and I keep fucking forgetting. I finally got an Ethernet cable. So, I'm plugged into the internet. So, if my internet is bad, it's not because of my Wi-Fi. It's either because of the actual internet source itself, which TBH in this house is sometimes a bit weird. Or, it's because your internet is shit. So just generally, if I if there's issues in the future, it's not because my internet's bad, probably. Okay. Like it's gotten a lot better. Um yeah. And I just I felt bad last time we did the sister space, there was like a lot of lag and stuff. So I'm like, you guys shouldn't have to sit through that. Also, it's painful for me to sit through that. So oh, toss stones like we're just wrapping up. Uh yeah. Well, actually, I've like lost track of the live chat. Maybe I'll see what the live chat says a bit. Oh, guys, what do you want me and Rachel to talk about this weekend? Throw out some ideas. Maple says, I need more realistic lesbian fiction. The ones I've been finding all seem to have at least one scene where a woman has an explosive orgasm with no clitoral stimulation. Yeah. Maple, somebody sent me yesterday a list of lesbian romance. I will email it to you, the list. Because like I haven't read any of them, but she's recommending them, so they must be better than that shit. Um, Ali says, I'm ashamed to say I bought a lesbian sex book when I had my first relationship with a woman. It felt like an instruction manual. I couldn't read it. Turns out just doing what comes naturally is cool. Yeah. Um, that's something else that hasn't been addressed in the books that I that I kind of thought would be addressed in the books. Because it's very common. A lot of lesbians, when they realize that they're sexually attracted to women, they go through a phase of being like, but what is lesbian sex? Like, of like having to unlearn, like, the patriarchal concept of, like, what sex is, like, that it's penetration, like, that's what the sex is, is the penetration. Um, and to also just be like, I can't even visualize what lesbian sex is. Like, maybe it's not as much of an issue now because porn. But being like, I can't even visualize what that is, right? And then, um, oh, what was I going to say next? Oh, and then, like, a fear of actually doing it. So, like, to me, the fact that you bought a book, there's nothing to be ashamed of, because, like, I'm a kind of person who like I want to be prepared for everything. When I leave the house, I have like an extra charging ca cable. I have like an extra battery. I have like Tylenol and Advil. Like whenever I leave the house, I'm like prepared for shit. I'm that kind of person, or you know. 
So like, I didn't do that, but I totally fucking understand why you would do that. Because it's like the first time you're with a woman is kind of like a monumental thing. It's like a big deal. You don't want to like fuck it up or like mess up or like, I don't know. Just I remember my first time I was like scared. I was like, I'm going to do something wrong. Like I'm going to hurt her or like not be good at it or something. Um, and this whole thing, like doing just turns out doing what comes naturally is cool. Like, <sighs> I wish there was more of an emphasis on that. Like, in this book, I wish there was a discussion of, like, lesbians having sex for the first time. Like, what is that like psychologically? That would be an interesting topic to discuss. I also think it would be interesting to discuss, like, how to differentiate, like, what are your internal feelings about, like, sex and sexuality and, like, sexual behavior versus, like, what are your imported or internalized feelings about sex and sexuality and sexual behavior. Like, those would be really interesting topics to talk about. And that's kind of what you're getting at, I think, Ali. Which I think she left already, but um dragon how did lesbians ever have sex before Foucault I know it's a mystery um So at the end of the day, like 70% of you said that you need physical, you need emotional attraction to feel sexual attraction. And <clears throat> yeah. And the rest were like varying degrees of that. Maple, I can't believe you typed that out and press send. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I don't know much. I know as much about Jung as I know about Freud, which is like from talking to therapists about Jung and Freud. I haven't like read anything by them like explicitly. I really should. Like I have some Jung books. Oh wait, actually they're my exes. Does she have them or do I have them? I feel like I probably forcibly gave them back to her. Well, whatever. But I do want to read some young. Because he also has stuff about language, which I'm so fucking into language. Um, but I always prefer to... Um, I always prefer to get my stuff from a female source, if possible. <laughs> Matt Adam, I just dove in first head, head first the first time, figuratively. <laughs> um... Aqua says, can you and Rachel discuss being politically homeless? I'd like to hear how you two feel about it. What do you think might happen or should happen in USA slash Canada um, strategies? Question mark. Okay, interesting. Um, Puzzle person says, I'm big into imagining alternative structures for women, like semi-committed living situations for child raising and general living that's not dependent on volatile sexual relationships. I totally fucking agree with you. I really, really think communal is the way to go when it comes to child rearing for women it's just like that's the best way for us to do it women um yeah totally fucking agree and also agree that like like to me one of the fundamental issues with the concept of the nuclear family aside from like the other many issues is that it's based on like a sexual romantic relationship which as you say are volatile which is not necessarily a stable home life right like, I'm not trying to make, like, all kids from broken homes are fucked or something. But, you know, generally it's a better thing if your home life stays the same for, like, most of your childhood, right? So, if it's, if you're, um, I've seen some kind of documentary a long time ago about, like, I think it was in Sweden. 
maybe it was in the Netherlands, but about like a communal family raising situation. And it's like, it just seems like the best thing ever. So like, you still know like who's like your mom or your parent or whatever, but it's like your extended family basically lives with you and they're not necessarily all related by blood or by marriage or whatever. So it's not like they're going to just like break up or whatever, you know? Um, anyway. Like, I'm totally into the idea of, like, getting a mortgage with a bunch of women. Like, getting a big house and, like, having, like, a five-way mortgage or something. And then, like, you know, living clown world, it's over. <laughs> but, like, getting a mortgage with, like, a bunch of women and, like, living together. and then, like, At least until the mortgage is paid off and then we could, like, sell it and, like, go our own separate ways, maybe. But, like, you know, like, collective, working collectively, women are much, can get a, a lot more done have a lot more autonomy i think toss stones do you think it would be different if it was all females i do know like i've heard very bad things toss stone says i grew up in a communal hippie house unsafe in a lot of ways like, I think it needs to be done very, very intentionally and carefully. Um. <laughs> Automatic or manual. <laughs> um. Okay. Yeah. It's the men. Plus, it's that whole, like, sexual liberation crap, I think, part of it. Too relaxed, no boundaries. Yeah. You gotta go to Saskatchewan because the houses are cheap. My best friend sold her her two-bedroom house with a loft in rural Saskatchewan for $80,000. Okay, dude. As much as the housing and cost of living in Saskatchewan is cheap, aside from travel, which is not cheap because you're in the middle of nowhere, I don't fucking want to live in Saskatchewan, man. Like, I lived in Manitoba, and there's nothing there. If anything, maybe I'll buy, I, like, if I was going to buy a house, like, if I was in a situation where I had, like, four or three or four other women who were like, let's buy a house together, I, like, obviously it would depend on who the fuck these women are. That would be, like, the biggest thing, because, like, where do they work and whatever, where are their lives? But I think, like, the ideal living situation in Canada when it comes to cost of living is to live... If you're going to buy a house, buy a house, like, not even in the suburbs, like, in the country, but, like, within 30 minutes of a medium-sized city. Because, it, it, like, the big metropolitan cities, like Montreal, or Toronto, Vancouver, you go 30 minutes out, you're not in the middle of nowhere. You're in the metropolitan, right? You go to a medium-sized city, like, um, yet, you know, I mean, it's relative what you consider a media-sized city. Gatineau, um, Fredericton, Kingston, Ontario, um, Thunder Bay, not that I would want to live there. And you go 20, 30 minutes outside the city, you're in the middle of nowhere, the houses are cheap. But you are, like, well within commuting distance to the city, and the city is, like, decent enough size that you have all the stuff you need. I think that's probably, like, the best housing situation, like, in, in for me, in my mind. Well, Dragon has already warned us that this horrible human being lives in Saskatchewan, so we should all avoid it. <laughs> like, toss stones. I totally, like, I've looked, I know a bit about, like, hippie commune child raising stuff. Everyone I know who I've ever talked to who's been through that said it was bad. And it was bad for like a couple of specific reasons. One, no boundaries, like you're saying. Another is that the kids feel like they didn't have like a strong enough connection with their own parents, that it was kind of just like a free for all. Um, and that the kids, it was more of like the kids spending time with each other than like the adults like mentoring and fostering a relationship with the children because it was like a bunch of kids and a bunch of adults 
all in one place. And so they were kind of like, it wasn't really like parented. So, but I'd like to think that like if lesbians or lesbian feminists did it, that they would be like intentional about like, what are the healthy boundaries? Like what are the goals and expectations? And like, you know, like constantly monitoring and tracking and stuff. Um, Tallstone says it was bad for the women. Um, you mean like in terms of like labor or like violence and sexual stuff or like everything? Um, Aqua, no, I can't. I'm from Toronto. I cannot. Even a city of a million, I'm like I'm in the middle of fucking nowhere. This is not even a city. Like I need a big, big city or else I feel like I'm in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> like the place I went to university was... I think would be considered um, like smaller mid-sized city in Canadian standards. 40,000 people. Um, and I literally felt like I was in a fucking ghost town. I couldn't stand it. I hated it so much. I was like, it's okay because I'm only here until I'm done university. But like, I no. M Montreal is like interesting. Quebec itself is very strange. Like, you live one hour from Gatineau, you live one hour from Trois-Rivières, you live one hour from Montreal, you live one hour from Quebec City, you're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, Montreal, it obviously has more of a metropolis than any of the other cities, but yeah. Um, anyway. Like, it's a small city, but I don't know. When I was there, I met a lot of indigenous people, and they were like, this is the big city. And I was like, well, I guess from your perspective, that's true. Because you come from a town of like 600 people, right? You're under 5,000. I mean, I wouldn't mind living in a town that's under five, or a city, whatever, that's under 5,000. If it's like, you know, less than 30 minutes from an actual city. No offense. But as a Torontonian, this is how I feel. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well no I would love I want to do like the cottage core thing but still like be able to like work and have like a career and shit like in a city you know um like in my ideal when I own this house which is like in the suburbs of a like million ish size city I have enough land that I can have like if I want dogs that can run around that if I want to have my friends over to like camping they can like camp on my land and we can have like bonfires and shit um oh that sounds so nice Marion dragon says I want access to all the different foods yeah uh, that's the one thing when I left Toronto I didn't realize like Toronto has I mean, I haven't been to Vancouver. They probably, I, they definitely have better sushi. But Toronto has a decent sushi and very good Greek food. And when I left, I was like, yeah. Aqua, I think us young folks are just going to rent forever. To be honest with you, I. Even if I had enough money for a down payment on something, I don't even know if I'd be like, you know what, a house is the most important thing to spend this on, you know? Um, but yeah, what's the average cost of a house in Toronto right now? It's like 800000 or something, right? Um, like the cheap houses in Toronto are like $750,000. And they're not even like in Toronto. Like if you talk to like someone who lives downtown, they would tell you that like, Technically, it's in the municipality of Toronto, but it's like a one hour bus ride to get to the city. And it's like $750,000 and it's like one bedroom. It's insane. Like, it's insane. It's ridiculous. Like, who the fuck? Like, Hustle Person says if you have three or four adults affording a house in an okay location, it becomes feasible. Yeah. Like with me renting a house with my roommates, it's like it's feasible to have a house instead of an apart like a one bedroom because of it's more of us, yeah, like collective, yeah. Um, well, Matt Adam, I hope you get the house when your parents die, and I hope it's paid off. 
so you can actually afford to live there. Um, okay. Jade, are you moving to Houston? Remember how, like, 10 minutes into the stream, I was like, I'm tired and hungry, guys. Like, this isn't going to be a very long stream. Here we are two hours later. Look, I started streaming at... It's been three hours that we've been streaming. Well, not we. I mean, I guess me, but... Um... Clown World says she wants to move to Florida. I don't know. Florida is pretty nuts, but I know that there's, like, a bunch of lesbian retirement communities in Florida. Um, and I know someone... I know a lesbian who's going to university in Florida and she would like drive to some of the lesbian retirement communities on the weekends to like hang out with them. And that to me sounds like fucking like spiritually amazing. Um, oh, cool, Jade. I hope that goes well for you. Well, Florida has Disney World. Which, like, you know, as much as we have problems with Walt Disney and all that and whatever, like, roller coasters and good food, to be honest. No, there's ha several of them in, in Florida, specifically Aqua. I know which place you're talking about. The Women's Liberation Radio News had a chat about the place in Florida. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, there's also, like, there's lesbian camping sites in Florida. Um... There's definitely, like, couples retreats for lesbians in Florida. There's, like, a lot of shit for lesbians in Florida. It's really interesting. Um, oh, no, the humidity is horrible and the sun. I'm not built for that climate, man. Whenever I go anywhere, like, south of... I don't know. Any, whenever I go anywhere south... Um... I get, like, really, really bad heat stroke and, like, dehydration and, like, death, basically. And it's, like, I'm prepared with my electrolytes and everything, but, like, no, I'm not built for that. <gasps> Marion! Thank you so much for the super chat. I very much appreciate it. Um... Also, okay, Marion, you are close to Montreal. Do you have a car? I think I would like to do like a meetup in Montreal um, this summer. Probably in July. I'm like, everything in my life is like booked up until the end of August already. Um, probably in July, I could take a weekend to go to Montreal. Um, it's under the minimum salary. <laughs> I don't want to live in the U.S. though. I used to want to go to university um, at a specific place in the U.S. Or like two or three specific places depending on what I wanted to do. But I was like, even going to university, like I don't want to fucking live in the U.S. It sounds scary to live in the U.S., guys. <laughs> like visiting is enough. I literally... Um, you have an apartment in Montreal. Bro. Let's hang out. I don't know, dude. You guys have like your healthcare is creepy and or non-existent or whatever. Um, your politics are like extremely bizarre and uncomfortable. Um, I feel like there's a lot of like gun violence in the U.S. Um. There's a lot of racism in the U.S. I don't know. Like, I literally know someone who got, like, a really good job at a university in the U.S. I think in Connecticut. It was definitely New England, but I'm pretty sure it was Connecticut. Um, and they were, like, 
I literally moved back to Canada because it was so racist in Connecticut. And I was like, wow, I don't know. Just, I don't think I'd be happy. Yeah, immigrating to Canada is, like, not that easy. I think really the way to do it is you have to, like, be a student here. And then when you're done, whatever you're doing, you usually have implied status. And then you, like, stay here while you have your implied status and you apply for your citizenship. But it's, like, you need to afford to go to school here in the first place. Because when you're on a student visa in Canada, I think you can only work 20 hours a week or something. Dragon says, as soon as I cross the border, I feel the difference. Yeah. Well, that's because we we usually cross the border in Detroit, don't we? <laughs> People from Detroit or Buffalo, which are, like, not great representations of, like, the amazingness of America, are they? <laughs> um. Yeah, the gun culture in the U.S. really freaks me out. Like, I'm friends with this woman who used to live in Dallas. No, wait. Or Houston. I don't remember. But she said where she lived, she's a nanny. Where she lived was like very, very like rich, um, like suburb. And that like that that she knew like teenage boys who would like go in their dad's pickup trucks and like take guns and like shoot at stop signs and crap, just like with guns like on the street, like for fun. I don't want to live in a country where that like I don't want to live in a country where gun checks are like where you can like check your gun like a coat check. I don't want to live in a country that has that crap, man. That's creepy. Like, you guys seem to think it's normal. That is not normal. I'm not okay with that. It's creepy. Uh -huh. Canada. Canada is basically the US, but without Olive Garden. That's what Canada is. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to Montana. I would be into going to Montana like for a visit. Um... Yeah, I know it depends where you are in the US. Like <clears throat> you have Olive Garden in Alberta? What? Do you mean you have, like, one Olive Garden in Calgary, or you actually have Olive Garden in Canada? Because, like, like, we don't have Arby's in Canada, but there's, like, four Arby's locations in Ontario. But, like, we don't, it's not, like, accessible in Canada. There's one in Kingston, there's one in Ottawa, there's one in Oshawa, and there's one in Guelph, I think. Those are the Arby's locations of Ontario. Um... <laughs> No, but Dragon, do we have, like, an Olive Garden? Or it's, like, a chain you can readily access? Oh, I thought Olive Gardens closed down in Canada, basically, in the 90s. Also, yes, I do have an encyclopedic knowledge of fast food. <laughs> okay, I'm looking in Ontario for Olive Garden. There's, no, it's telling me the closest ones that are, like, in Buffalo, in Water to New York, and in, like, Michigan. There's, like, a handful. There's, like, five Olive Gardens in Canada, and they're all in the prairies. So, I guess Aqua gets dibs on Olive Garden. <laughs> No, I know there used to be one across from the Eaton Center. Um, yeah. I think that's the one I... I think I went there once when I was like a little kid. And then it closed down. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I love how I was like, you know what Canada is? It's America without Olive Garden. <laughs> like, that's the defining characteristic of America is Olive Garden. Okay. 
No, but you know what's better than Olive Garden is Cracker Barrel. And like, obviously, while I was a gluten-free vegan, I didn't eat there. But as a child, I have very fond memories of clack- Cracker Barrel. Like, it's just like very chill when you've been sitting in the car for 10 hours to go and eat in a Cracker Barrel. Um, and it doesn't feel like really like fast processed food. You know what I mean? Not, no, Pickle Barrel is not Cracker Barrel. Pickle Barrel is good, but it's a bit, it's gotten more like expensive and I don't know. Hey, Ghost. Um, the best thing at Cracker Barrel, though, I mean, Pickle Barrel, is the French toast. They have, like, this weird, like, like a puff. It's, like, these giant, like, puffy pieces of bread. And then the way they fry them, it's almost like they're, like, fuzzy with the, like, the batter, like, the egg and vanilla and shit. It's, like, so fucking good. Like, it's, like, fluffy and sweet. It's, like, so really good. Um <laughs> isn't the best thing to pick up. <laughs> you know what I like about Denny's when I was gluten-free? You can get a gluten-free Eggs Benedict at Denny's and nowhere else. Oh, yeah, I'm just talking about food now because I'm starving. Okay, we're going to end the stream. I'm going to go eat. I will see you guys tomorrow. Probably. Almost definitely. And if I do not see you tomorrow, then I 1000% for sure will see you on Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, noon Eastern time, 5 p.m. GMT. All right. I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> We're mocking Matt Adam for missing lunch. <laughs> okay. Bye, guys.